A little over a month ago, the new Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, General Charles Brown Jr., delivered a stark warning. He asserted that his service's ability to maintain air dominance in a future war is in jeopardy. That in short, the U.S. Air Force has to accelerate change, adapting new technologies faster than our potential adversaries, or it could risk ceding control or command of the air. I've asked AFPC Fellow in Defense Studies, Jenny McArdle, here today to discuss what's behind this statement and why did he say it. Hi, Jenny. Annie, um, thanks for having me, and that's such a good question. You know, to start, while General Brown was speaking solely about his service, his comments weren't unique. There's been this broad-based recognition across the Defense Department and the military that business as usual won't work, that each service must innovate and radically change to meet the challenges of a future complex and contested battle space. So, to get back to what you were saying, and you know, perhaps reframe, reframe it a bit, why is it that some within the military are starting to warn that the US, you know, the country with the largest defense budget in the world, could theoretically lose a future war? So over the last decade, competitors and potential adversaries, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, they've invested heavily in a range of military capabilities with the intention of depriving the US allies and coalition partners to project the ability to project power into their near abroad. So labeled anti-access area denial, these capabilities, which range from cyber to ballistic missiles and manned and uh, unmanned attack aircraft among you know, other platforms, they basically afford their owners a degree of strategic depth by raising the risk and cost of intervention. And these capabilities and strategies, they undermine the current American way of war, a way of war that's largely predicated on power projection, the capacity to operate from sanctuaries, attrition, and overwhelming technological superiority. If the US is to compete and prevail in future competition and combat, we need to radically reform our way of war. So the big question then is how do we reform? So a natural way to start to answer that question is to start to identify those technologies and capabilities that may provide us an edge in future competition and combat. So after decades of investing in a small number of exquisite manned platforms, some defense analysts are starting to call for a reconceptualization of U.S. military posture towards one focused more on mass, autonomy, survivability, or expendability. So basically think low-cost autonomous robotic systems, whether on you know, air, land, or sea. And others have characterize the ongoing technological transformation as a shift from a hardware-centric military to a software-centric force. So one dependent on disaggregated multinodal networks, data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, among other cyber and informationized capabilities. But, you know, as we start to think about this type of reform, Technology is really only one piece of the puzzle. And on its own, it's just not gonna be a panacea. The key then is to organizationally and operationally innovate around that technological change to really drive that revolution in our future force. And a big part of that requires discovery and experimentation. So just as there is this deep focus on discovery, innovation, and experimentation in the inner war years when developing new concepts of operation around you know, the tank and carrier warfare, the US also needs to invest in that type of process today. There's just a lot of big questions we need to grapple with. You know, for instance, like what does joint all domain operations look like in practice? How do you address some of the cross-domain challenges unique to integrating the cyber domain, like timing, sequencing, or authorities and classification. What's the ideal composition of our future force, both manned and unmanned? Um, what role does information operations play for us in future competition and combat? And you know, how should we structure and develop a distributed command and control architecture for joint all-domain operations? You know, these are not simple questions. 
discovery and experimentation allows us to come to grips with a lot of these problem sets. You know, whether through war games, structured field experiments, modeling and simulation, or exercises, these types of events allow decision makers to validate future concepts of operation through continuous iteration and adaptation. And while there is this, you know, renewed interest in wargaming across the defense establishment, more really needs to be done. So right now, no agency, activity, or joint function within the DoD has clear responsibility for joint concept development and experimentation. You know, moreover, defense and service level investments in the type of environments, so like synthetic environments that will empower experimentation across all domains, it's really largely at a nascent stage of development. We need to organizationally change to really empower future experimentation and concept development. And you know, what's more, our future force isn't solely dependent on developing new creative concepts of operation around emerging technologies. Warfare is, and it's going to remain at the end of the day, a human clash of wills. We also need to rethink how we maximize the potential and lethality of our most valuable assets, our workforce. We need to rethink military education and training. So this has been a key focal area of the 2018 National Defense Strategy and the Joint Chiefs have built, um, built on this, releasing you know, this past spring a new vision for professional military education. So, you know, in short, the military recognizes that it isn't just about achieving technological overmatch, but also intellectual overmatch. There's a drive to change education and training away from these intermittent learning opportunities that are often based on brick and mortar institutions to a distributed learning architecture that really empowers point of view learning. You know, this kind of environment allows warfighters to continuously define. Um, develop and refine, you know, their intellectual skills. So a big part of that is having a synthetic environment that can allow warfighters to repeatedly access what should be these immersive education and training opportunities, whether they're on deployment, on a base, or at home. And this again requires us to reform. We need to reform how we think about learning content delivery, whether we're talking about education, individual and collective training, or tactical and operational decision support. So I guess, you know, in summary, our future force requires a wholesale rethink from the ground up. Not only when thinking about the types of capabilities we plan to use when we fight, but also how we fight and how we prepare to fight. And this type of pretty radical change is not going to come easily. You know, as Max Weber once said, the essence of bureaucracy is routine, repetitive, and orderly action. Defense bureaucracies by their nature are slow moving, ponderous beasts. There will always be institutions or individuals that favor the status quo. But the US in the past has shown that when faced with formidable competitors and potential adversaries, whether you know, it was during the interwar years or during the Cold War, that reform's possible. So I do have a lot of optimism. This is fascinating. Um, okay. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank um, you. Thanks for yeah. having me. Yeah, and I hope to talk to you soon. Brilliant, you too. Thanks. Thanks, sure.